everyone. We get a clear oh, answer. Uh, the organizers standing. scheduling this meeting to be square. I have no idea. In fact, I just I'm seeing that since this morning. So I'm still to figure out what that is about. Can I can I request all of you to mute, please? Okay, thanks so much. So uh, this is a, a series of webinars what we conduct uh, uh, for the Cambridge International Schools. And uh, my name is Lalit. Uh, I work as a regional uh, manager for South India. Uh, taking care of uh, three states, predominantly Karnataka, Telangana, and Andhra. And uh, uh, what we do is that to support uh, the schools to implement Cambridge program uh, uh, in a more uh, Cambridge way and also probably uh, get into the meaningful transactions of teaching and learning. So uh, we bring in experts and also we bring in some experts within our network. For example, some schools would have expertise in uh, teaching a particular subject bring in them and also uh, kind of conduct these uh, webinars as a support system. And today we have a, a, a think tank with us uh, who have been doing uh, a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, showing us uh, how to deal with practicals. And uh, just for all, all of them who are present here in terms of delegates, uh, so what we did is uh, we contacted ThinkTech and also requested them to map uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Cambridge IGCSE uh, experiments. And also uh, we wanted them to say that, okay, uh, here are a few experiments that uh, would be helpful to uh, share with the teachers uh, in terms of talk about it, not share exactly, talk about it with the teachers and also see how we can take forward. So uh, what I also want to uh, mention here is that uh, we are not completely endorsing any product as such because Cambridge International uh, itself is an organization uh, which don't uh, endorse. I mean, at least I don't have a capacity or uh, I'm not competent to endorse any products which should uh, ideally happen at the UK, not, not uh, in my uh, kind of limits. But still, what we thought is uh, these experiments, uh, uh, the way that uh, the ThinkTech has uh, gone through and also probably implemented it would be uh, uh, definitely useful uh, for some of our teachers and also uh, uh, specifically during such times where uh, the pandemic has struck and uh, we can't uh, actually meet each other and also uh, ask students to come to schools and things like that. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two is that uh, the process that we followed is uh, we sent a, a registration form to all the schools and the uh, schools, uh, when I say all the schools, the schools are from three states, Karnataka, Telangana, and Andhra. And uh, uh, I think there was a very, very great response. Uh, we received around 175 responses to this uh, particular webinar. And uh, they've all registered. And also we asked them, do you have any specific point or a question? So uh, what I've done is I've taken those questions and points and also shared it with uh, uh, Vishal and uh, Pacheta. And also some of the questions are not, uh, I mean, I don't think uh, they are able to answer. For example, how do we conduct, uh, I mean, will there be a, a practical exam in November series? Those questions are for me. And also those questions are for Cambridge, not for uh, uh, think tank uh, people. So probably I think we'll take those questions later and uh, uh, we, we will see how, and also the think tank team has assured us that they have taken care of those questions uh, and also probably they are going to touch upon uh, all of them during uh, this one and a half hour. So I'm not going to waste any more and uh, time in terms of any more time. I will uh, hand over it to Prachita and also uh, Vishal and I'll be uh, uh, all through the session with you all. So if there are any things that you want to kind of share please uh, post it on the chat box so that we can pick up those points and also answer it later. And uh, I would again request uh, all of you to mute yourself so that uh, uh, the, the speaker's voice are clearer to us in terms of when they uh, Is that all clear? And uh, probably I think uh, uh, if there is nothing on the chat box, so then, oh, sorry, I can hand it over to uh, Vishal and uh, Prachita. So over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lalit. Yeah. Vishal, you want to? Uh, maybe you can start, Pro. Uh, 
yeah give a give an introduction <clears throat> yeah so uh, as uh, mr lalit prasad said we are a science education organization we've been around for the last uh, uh, three years as a company called think tech the name of the company comes from the idea that uh, we want children to think and the word tack is from the word tactile uh, so using of hands to make science experiments models toys uh, using simple un raw unprocessed materials to uh, to make science engaging in the classroom uh, you might find the name of the program unlab also quite interesting because that's uh, what we are trying to say is that you can have a lab in any setting you don't need Uh, fancy equipment in a formal laboratory setting but you can have a lab in your home in your classroom as long as you have some very simple materials uh, to work with so that's the premise that we've been uh, following uh, since we set up uh, uh, both as a company which was 3 years ago and we have a, a non-profit trust called innovation and science promotion foundation that's been around for more than 6 uh, years now and uh, ISPF of course started as i said uh, in 2014 and uh, it's the same founders and trustees of ISPF who then founded the company think tank uh, both organizations do the same work it's just that ISPF works directly with government with ngo with partners and so on to implement these programs in government schools uh, in in rural settings in uh, underprivileged societies so on and so forth using grant money csr money and applying for propo uh, grant proposals and things like that whereas think tech works with the private sector in private schools and in the retail sector where we again do the same work of trying to get as many children to make these activities uh, as possible so whether that's through schools or directly with a parent etc that's the uh, that's the idea to try and get kids to engage with science in a hands on way uh because of this we have uh, also explored various ways in making things uh, especially with the pandemic with making things purely from household materials and things uh, uh, available at home so a lot of our activities we have almost 400 activities in our portfolio covering physics chemistry biology we've looked at the syllabuses and uh, boards of uh, all the i mean the syllabuses of all the boards that has uh, taught across india and we've mapped each of these boards and grades to uh, hands on activities and we've been able to do that for about 60 to 70% of the topics that are taught in the school curriculum uh, in india across these boards so, uh, so so that's so that's how we have organized our program it's a grade wise program for each class uh, suggesting a certain set of activities uh, and Uh, what we will do today is briefly show you about 10 or 12 of these uh, so it's a very short selection uh, but uh, some of our quite interesting and popular activities some of them may be familiar to you so we'll you know hopefully the discussions and the kind of uh, direction we take it in will make it uh, uh, quite interesting some of them may be totally new to you and the idea is to show you how simple it is to make some of these activities as well as play with them and the enormous scope for exploration and uh, variations that are possible in these activities which makes it very easy for a child to tinker play explore you know make remake rebuild things like that uh, so hopefully you get a feeling of that uh, uh, that idea and then uh, the entire process through which a child will go through while going through one of these activities uh, how to implement it in an online Uh, setting things like that uh, we will be able to uh, impart to you hopefully over the next hour or so so i think for about 30 or 40 minutes we'll have a we'll have a quick demonstration of the activities and then we'll uh, uh, we'll wind up uh, after around uh, you know by 1:30 we should hope to finish uh, all that with a q and a session and any questions that you might have Uh, but i think we can start right away vishal with the demo yes yes bro okay good afternoon everyone uh, as prachita and uh, lalit sir said my name is vishal i'm one of the founders of think tank uh, the 
protocol we will follow during the call is uh, let's keep it informal so if you have a question feel free to call uh, however uh it's very likely that some of your questions get answered especially related to the program if you have a question related to the science behind some of the demonstrations that we make feel free to ask right away also we are a larger group so uh, one of the convenient ways to interact is uh, poll questions will probably be also be throwing uh, three or four poll questions in between Vishal, you are muted. Thanks. Uh, I suppose I'm audible now. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, I was saying. Uh, I, I I hope you heard me till the poll question. So uh, just respond to the poll questions freely. That will just help us build on top of uh, the responses. Okay. I'll start with something. pretty simple so we have some activities which do not require uh, any special material most of it can be arranged using whatever is available at home i'll start with one such example we will also be showing some which require slightly special material and uh, we'll talk about how uh, that can be arranged if there is enough interest uh, what i have here in my hand is just two pieces of plastic straws which have been uh, placed at an approximate right angle with the help of this blue colored rubber piece uh and since there are two straws plastic straws so they are uh as one would naturally think uh one thing we can do with it is to try taking water in or we can try blowing into it so i have a cup of water with me and four combinations are possible uh i place this end of the straw in water and i take the air in second possibility is i blow third possibility is i shift this place the other end and repeat the same for each of the cases i would request you to uh, make a prediction of what will happen uh, as you would appreciate if you have predicted before the experiment happens then you are more prepared you already have a hypothesis and it's easier to uh, connect once we see the results so here comes the first one i'm putting this end and i'm going to take the air in just to get the thoughts going i'll narrate some of the options one is maybe the water comes up through the straw enters this and enters my mouth enters this straw and enters my mouth second possibility is uh, it comes up falls back into the cup third is maybe bubbles get produced fourth is let's say the sound gets produced so i just took the air in didn't make a difference now i'll try blowing from this end so two possibilities exhausted nothing happened you can also type your response on the chat window so now i have changed the end so i'm putting the other end and i'll take the air in again nothing happened now is the fourth possibility let's see if that has any effect so though there is lot of light coming in from the window i hope you were able to see the spray coming out a beautiful spray comes out and obviously it happened only when one of the two ends it was this end of the straw when it was placed in water then a spray was generated now is there something special in this end so first thing is note that these are two separate pieces of straw second is i want to draw your attention to this place do you see anything different when i am placing it this way versus this way and i'm taking a pause for few seconds so that you can observe and hopefully also respond so this place so when i i placed this end of this straw in water then the spray came out but when i placed it like this nothing happened okay uh let me see if there is anything any response on the 
yes there is water is exerting pressure but water should exert pressure regardless right and water would have a pressure in because of the gravity and in the all the direction if you go by pascal's law how is the water exerting pressure upward so yes the way people often say when it comes to solids any phenomenon happening you name newton and you'll be right most likely and when it comes to fluid you say pressure and it will be sorry was i was i overlapping with someone uh, responding to the question i don't think so uh, there have been some others who have said cyclone creation and then hmm. uh, right now someone saying lp on top of vertical straw i'm assuming that means low pressure no that i have said okay okay yeah. okay okay let's let's uh, do little playing around so yes as some of you observe this straw is blocking half mouth of this straw whereas when i'm placing it like this then it's all clear so then it means if i take a slightly different setup here this straw is not blocking the mouth of this straw and neither is this straw blocking it and in that case what will happen and to get your responses quickly i'm launching this poll question uh, I'll wait for another 10 seconds. Pro, are the responses visible to you on your screen? No, unfortunately not. Because we've yeah. Because I'm seeing zero people have responded to the poll so far. Um, we have responded. Uh, we responded. Yes, sir. We responded. Okay. Thank you for confirming. I think and only. And the poll. Yeah. I think only Raghu can see that. Oh, I'll okay. make you. That's fine. Uh, Co-host. That's fine. That's fine, Raghu. It's fine, Raghu. No, 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 no. Don't yeah. change anything. Okay. Yeah. So, fifty-four percent people have said uh, there will be no spray. Sixteen uh, percent have said spray from both hands. 8% have said uh, spray from only one and if you blow harder then it may spray from both is what 22% people are saying let's test it quickly that's the beauty of uh, this kind of setup you raise an appropriate question and you can very quickly try it out you don't have to keep imagining and keep theorizing okay so i'm placing the end which is which has the black tape in water so spray is not getting generated i'll blow harder that was as hard as i could blow so clearly both straw spray getting generated is not the right answer let me try the other end now i'm blowing quite hard still nothing is happening so very clearly it is required it is necessary for the straw to block half mouth without that nothing is happening and as i think danya had said if i am getting the name correctly this straw when it is blocking half mouth of the other straw this region there is a the air which comes from here that experiences a narrower region because of that the speed of air increases as the speed increases there are fewer number of air particles in this region at any given point of time one person sitting in one room versus 50 people sitting in the same room 50 people will naturally exert more pressure i'm not sure how the poll has come back uh hence when the air is air particles are moving faster there is a low pressure region created here compared to the air inside the straw and hence this air gets pushed up and after that the water gets pushed up you be see this phenomenon sometimes people very quickly jump to oh, this is bernoulli's principle sometimes occasionally people also say magnus effect uh, i would say let's draw attention uh, let's pay attention to the fundamental point that 
what's happening is whenever the speed of fluid increases the pressure of the fluid decreases uh, because bernoulli sometimes is in an existing flow and hence people uh, it's, it's inaccurate sometimes we see this all the time uh, imagine you have uh, so pro is is my uh, window visible or the pole is blocking the view no 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 you are visible okay, me you are visible so imagine my uh, this hand this was the window here are the curtains so on this side if the wind is blowing perpendicular to the curtains then curtains naturally get lifted up imagine what will happen if the wind is blowing in this direction in that case the high speed wind will create a lower pressure here compared to the pressure of air inside the room and hence the curtains will get stuck to the window uh in the same way many people use this in sports that when uh, let's say uh, in cricket the ball is spun and it's also moving up or down because of the spinning and also the upward or downward movement there is a difference in the speed with which air can move on the two sides of the ball and because of the speed difference because on one side air is getting the air is facing resistance whereas on the other side it is in the same direction in which the ball is spinning and because of that the pressure difference happens and the ball also gets a lateral movement so uh, the football players while taking the corner goal they spin it and kick it upwards and typically they have people in their team to kick it inside the goal but even if they don't have anyone a skilled football player will be able to make it take a turn at the right place and the goalkeeper is taken by a surprise that without any teammate coming into picture the ball actually gets a lateral drift and enters the goal uh in a very short while i have explained uh something which otherwise may look very complex and through just two pieces of straws plenty of variations possible here i'll not go into them right now uh, there's one interesting extension to this which one of the children in our workshop gifted to us i think uh, prachita can show that Should I go? Yes. Yeah. So as Vishal showed you, just something like this. And once we made in our workshop, we started making this, and a child came up to us and said, "Why oh, are you making a sprinkler?" We said, "Sprinkler? No, we are making something fun with to play with water, uh, spray, but not a sprinkler." He said, "No, no, you can take any kind of twig or a skewer, poke it right through the rubber in which you put the straw, and you've made yourself a sprinkler." and we said oh wow you're actually right because we also make a sprinkler through this fashion where we actually use a single piece of straw and a stick going through the middle of the straw and we cut two equidistant paths from this uh, skewer and we just cut the straw partially fold it at the bottom like this so you have two holes here created and the two open ends of the straw down here and you can tie that with a tape and get something that looks like this so this and this now look quite similar uh, the straws may be of different length and uh, different color or whatever but otherwise very much quite similar and um, the only difference being say the angle uh, of the straws so this we know very much to be 90 degrees between the straws here it's, it's uh, significantly less so an acute angle and so that also gives you then the scope for making things of various different angles and you can see how that actually makes a difference when talking about sprinklers so what i'll do now is because for the sprinkler it's good to see the um the spray of the water on the on the floor and kind of the distribution of the water takes so i'll just point my camera uh, downwards towards the floor so give me a minute and uh, we'll play a little bit with the sprinkler okay So I've spread a piece of newspaper here. I have a, a mug of water, and I'm going to take first the sprinkler that that Vishal showed was a spray, and I'm going to use this as a sprinkler. And you may be able to see the water come out. And as I rotate it, it spreads water all over the floor. Yeah. you can see it on the newspaper makes it visible 
you may be able to see the sprinkle come out of the sprinkler as well. So it's just coming out from the top of the straws. Okay. Similarly, I can use I can use the other just a single straw and stick sprinkler and sprinkle this as well. And again, you can see the water come out. It's spraying quite evenly over the paper and the floor. And it's uh, the distance it's traveling is different from the previous sprinkler. Maybe that's because of the height. The other very interesting thing about these two types of sprinklers are that they're not typically how our garden sprinkler works, right? Our garden sprinkler usually has uh, going in the same direction, a sprinkler that keeps going in the same direction and sprinkle. Here by design, I'm going back and forth, back and forth with this sprinkler. And what does that mean? That means that I'm constantly also changing the speed and the direction of the sprinkler. So that's not very common, where I'm constantly changing the speed and direction of the sprinkler. So that means that the water gets distributed quite evenly across a large area. So now, but we want sprinklers to do that typically in the garden. So what are the various ways in which a sprinkler is made to do that? One of the ways is you sometimes have a obstructing flap here, so which keeps opening and closing. So it kind of blocks the water and allows it. And so the water gets sprayed all over. And the other one, sometimes you have a stop, start, stop, start kind of in the same direction. So that is again changing its speed constantly. So you have the water go at uh, different distances, right? But when talking about something like the sprinkler going back and forth and constantly changing speed and direction, then can you even introduce topics such as uh, simple harmonic motion or oscillatory motion by design, if I'm going, starting slow, going fast and slowing down and then changing direction, I have a very beautiful change in speed kind of uh, situation happening here, the rotational speed constantly changing. And that can be talked of even in terms of an oscillatory or simple harmonic motion. Now, what I also have very interestingly, just to show a contrast between what a constant uh, in the same direction a constant velocity sprinkler would do versus what I've just shown to you. I've made this very uh, exciting variation of the same activity. So that's using a cut bottle. I've cut a bottle uh, right at the base and I've placed two straws much like I have uh, placed for the regular sprinkler. So they're again kind of in a V-shape here. The two straws are just placed at the bottom of the bottle their uh, base of the bottle. So they have a gap there for the water to go into the straws. And I've tied three strings to the rim of this uh, cut bottle. The idea here is that if I spin this bottle, I can wind up the strings. And then of course, as I unwind, the strings will all unwind at the same time uh, and make sure oh, that proud. the bottle spin in one direction and for quite some time. So for for a good portion of it, it's spinning in the same direction and almost at the same speed. And we can see what that does with the sprinkle that we get. So this is very interesting, especially when you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, what variables you can change to see the impact this has on things like how far the water goes, uh, does the length of the straw matter, does the angle of the straw matter, does the speed of this rotation matter. You can see there's quite a lot of things built in these strings. Huh? And oh, water in there. So I'll again point this towards the floor. Right now you can see two wet pieces of newspaper there. I'm going to put a dry bit of newspaper so that you can see. I'm going to cover this a bit. And through this, I'm going to put about half the thing on the water but, and like this. Now unwind. So you should be able to spinning. After a certain time and the speed builds up, the water starts coming out. And it should become quite clear that the water is now falling in a perfect circle. Yeah, there's not any water going beyond a certain point and there's no water falling right in the middle either. 
So although the sprinkler may not be very useful for commercial garden purpose, it's surely very useful when it comes to understanding the concept of learning the science behind this. And that is, we have a same direction, constant velocity sprinkler, where I'm keeping the angles of the straws constant, then I'll get the distance constant. If I change those variables, as it gets slower, you can see some more water falling closer and closer to the middle. So the circle has gotten slightly smaller, but still very dry in the center and a ring, almost a band of water forming a very nice circle. And that's how a constant speed sprinkler uh, would work. And this will allow you to study various things in uh, rotation. Uh -huh. Talk about why the water climbs up the straws and comes out and how, you know, mm -hmm. A merry-go-round or any one of those things. So that's a little bit about sprinklers. Uh, back to you, Kishan. Vishal, unmute, please. Not sure why this keeps happening on its own. Uh, thanks for reminding. Uh, I just saw a message on the chat window. So yes, we will be talking about how you can get access to these resources. Okay, moving to the next topic. Uh, I want to demonstrate one interesting, very, very interesting activity. But for that, there is some uh, one more background experiment which is required. What I have here in uh, this test tube is uh, turmeric mixed with water. As uh, some of you uh, may already know, turmeric can be used as an acid base indicator. But what exactly uh, can it be used? Is it uh, possible to use it as a base indicator or acid indicator? Let me quickly check uh, your uh, current uh, state of uh, understanding. So please respond to this poll question. Okay, another 10 seconds to go. I request you to keep yourself on mute unless you need to speak. Okay, so 42% uh, people have said it can be used uh, to identify both acids and base solutions, alkaline solutions. 40%, uh, 39.5% people have said it can be used only to find out if it's alkaline. And 19% people have said to find acidic solutions, okay, to identify acidic solutions. So let me just give the basics. If I add an acid to this, so I have uh, vinegar in this uh, bottle. Let me add few drops of vinegar to this solution and let's see if there is any change in color because an indicator uh, is useful if we see a color change. So I added vinegar, there's no change in the color. So clearly by adding acid, there's no change in the color of turmeric. I have some base here. I've intentionally taken a slightly stronger base. I have some sodium hydroxide in this bottle. I'll put few drops of it. Uh, my intent was to make the color change visible even when I'm showing this online. So I put few drops of uh, sodium hydroxide. Initially the color changed and it went back as we mixed. So I've added few more drops. And as you can see, now there is a very nice maroon color. Uh, so this tells us that when I add a a solution which is alkaline in nature to turmeric and water, then the color changes and hence I can use turmeric as a base indicator. Now what about acid? So question is, what will happen if I add the vinegar back to this? Will the color change back to yellow or it will remain red? Okay, let's 
quickly try that out. So I'll again take the bottle uh, which had vinegar and I've deliberately taken a combination of sodium hydroxide and vinegar because a common perception is that yeah, vinegar is acidic, but it's a very weak acid. Uh, but the point we also want to highlight here is, as you can see, as soon as I added few drops of vinegar, the vinegar is good enough to neutralize. And interestingly, for most of the chemistry experiments till the 10th grade, we have seen that these very basic chemicals which are available inside the kitchen, vinegar or citric acid or lemon juice and let's say soda or detergent, these are good enough or for that matter even the uh, calcium oxide, the chuna powder, that's good enough to conduct the experiment. So as you can see, the color has changed back to yellow and hence turmeric can be used as an acid as well as base indicator, but it's in the combination with vermilion. So traditionally, vermilion, which is uh, kumkum, uh, which is called kumkum in some regions of India, it used to be made by mixing chuna, the lime powder, with uh, turmeric, uh, and hence vermilion can add as, uh, can work as an acid indicator, and turmeric itself can work as a base indicator. So in that sense, it's a complete indicator that's available right inside our kitchen. What would be very interesting to think though, uh, if the color of turmeric changes when we add a base to it, then why don't we see this all the time happening inside our kitchen? Okay, last five seconds. Hmm. So 14% people have said we miss observing the change. 68% have said most food items are acidic or neutral. And 18.6, around 19% people have said Indian cuisine has a pH balance built into the menu. Okay, uh, when we uh, started conducting this experiment with children, we were surprised because we started testing and we start, started using different indicators, including some very sensitive indicators. And we learned that actually most of the food items, so we did not, we could not come across a single vegetable or fruit, which is basic. It was either neutral or acidic. And then we started doubting the spices, but the spices also we saw the ditto same pattern and including uh, one of the famous vegetables, bitter gourd, which people say that, yeah, uh, bases are bitter and acidic acids are sour. Uh, bitter gourd is highly acidic. And if you have received a WhatsApp message like me, which says that there are these 10 advantages of eating bitter gourd or drinking bitter gourd juice, and first reason being it's basic, that's utterly wrong. The WhatsApp university hasn't got this right. Bitter gourd, as well as so many other vegetables and fruits, including things like papaya, watermelon, or pomegranate, they are all acidic, uh, and some of them are neutral. So how does this work? Why doesn't our stomach burn? Stomachs, human stomach's pH level is between one to two, and that's very conducive for digesting the protein which is present in the food that we eat. There is this enzyme called uh, pepsin, uh, which gets activated only in acidic environment. And we also had one activity. Now, uh, clearly this is one of those tactile activities for which a special material is required. We need to supply the pepsin enzyme. But we can package that in the kit extremely safe. Uh, this falls in that category where children would need a special material. So we set up three different setups. One which has only citric acid, one which has only pepsin enzyme, and another which has acid and enzyme and we put few pieces of egg and uh, and for the vegetarians uh, uh, replacement of that and overnight it gets digested and you can't see any egg pieces only in the third environment where you have acid as well as pepsin so let me take 
a quick extension of turmeric as an acid base indicator and a very interesting application of that to a very different concept so here in a test tube i have i have two test tubes here in both i have taken two solutions of uh, vermilion which i have uh, taken from this container where i had mixed calcium oxide calcium oxide mixing with water becomes calcium hydroxide and i have a base solution i'm going to blow into one of these test tubes and see if the carbon dioxide coming out in the exhaled air can neutralize this and change the color of the solution and i'm going to blow out normally please be patient with me it's very interesting activity i'll be uh, counting as i exhale those of you who are counting with me have already uh, taken around 15 breaths the color change is still not very visible i'll continue to blow and hopefully we should see this very soon and after 30 breaths you can clearly see a difference in the color and hence what i have just done is designed a meter for uh, measuring the my respiration rate so if i use the same concentration of the lime solution uh, and repeat the exercise after a uh, repeat this uh, experiment after a quick physical exercise i should be able to reduce the number of breaths required from 30 to close to 15 or 20 and through this we have children uh, record the data uh, of their own compare it with their friends with family members and as you can see all that's required is turmeric and some chuna powder which is available uh, in any nearby store and typically we work with children on the respiratory system along with the circulatory system and respiratory system there are another two three interesting activities for this i may have to move slightly back backward what i have with me is a polythene cover close to 5 uh, feet long one end we have tied a knot and hence i can use this to check how much air i am able to breathe into so i'll take one deep inhale and exhale so that the extent of air that i could breathe out in one deep exhale i have a 1 liter pet bottle here the diameter of this plastic cover matches with the diameter of uh, the pet bottle so i can use this to estimate the amount of air i have blown out so that's close to 3 liters and this very quickly using a very simple instrument i am able to estimate my lung capacity to be close to 2.75 to 3 liters and children typically measure this record and since it's this simple they carry it all around and compare it with different people of different age groups within their family and friend circles hmm pro yeah so that was a very interesting bit about a uh, lot of the respiration and metabolic rate and things like that what's very interesting about this whole respirometer is yes you can uh, conduct it with your family friends and so on you can also change it uh, uh, change the situation or the criteria based on your own condition for example how many how many breaths or how many liters of air did you need to blow into that uh, kumkum 
uh, vermilion water to make it yellow, uh, whether after you're sleeping, maybe after you've uh, gotten up in the morning, then you can have a run. And when you're, when you're panting and doing it, whether that changes the amount of air you need to blow in. Uh, theory tells us that our metabolic rate increases. So the amount of carbon dioxide in our exhaled breath should be uh, more in concentration. So you should need a less amount to blow into that to change it when you're, uh, when you're exerted. Uh, different people have different metabolic rates. You can, uh, you know, we know some people who are lucky who eat a lot but remain very thin and we say, oh, you have a high metabolic rate. Does that balance with the data that we can collect using an experiment such as the respirometer? And one of the very interesting things about uh, working with instruments like this is that you can expand it to introduce some more instruments and activities, tactile activities. So here is one where we make a stethoscope with children. And this is again using some specialized material like these rubber tubes and a piece of metal binding wire to give this this binaural shape of a stethoscope and some foam and all that to act as the earplugs. You might think that this is just a static model, but it actually works very well. Yeah, so I put this here. I have this connected to a bottle cap or, a, uh, or any kind of, uh, you know, a container like that, um, a hemispherical, uh, you know, a half a ball or something like that. And I put these tubes through that in holes and I cover this just with a tight balloon membrane that I tie, that I tie here. And if I put this on my chest and I put this here, I can actually like a normal uh, medical stethoscope actually hear uh, the heartbeat. So it's a very good, I mean, of course, just finger count. Here you can hear the clear lambda sound. You can hear other things as well. When you place it at the back, you can hear the breathing. When you place it further down, you can hear uh, the digestive work that the stomach is doing. But the idea of this, of course, in this particular instance is to count the number of heartbeats per minute and correlate that to the, uh, to the number of breaths or the amount of air that you've blown into that uh, little bit of basic uh, turmeric water to see if when it becomes neutralized, right? So can we compare heart rate to metabolic rate and you can extend the experiment that way. The stethoscope also allows an extension in another direction. And that is if I have a balloon placed here and I'm told that, oh, that captures the sound because the balloon, balloon vibrates and creates a sound that goes up these tubes. We are always told that for sound to be produced, you need vibration. So how do we see that? And there's, of course, many simple experiments. You can do it with the balloon itself. Here I have <clears throat> an even simpler tool where you can actually experience and see that. So I have these two <clears throat> pieces of straw. What have I done with the straw? I've cut it at one end to make it kind of V-shaped. Right? And if you look at it from the side, it looks like a crocodile's jaw or a bird's beak. And I put this arrowhead into my mouth and blow from it and I get a nice, very nice kind of sound or whistle or whatever you want to call it. I have an identical straw, just that's just shorter in length and I do the same thing with that. I make this kind of V cut like that and I place this in my mouth. Right, so I have the shorter straw making a sound like that. The longer straw making a sound like that. What's the difference between the two? So the length is different and the sound they produce something there is different. And the whole conversation about how, you know, having a different length of air column has an impact on, you know, whether something is sharper or deeper or get to the technical words like pitch and frequency and wavelength, how this determines that, whether in some area in this pipe, there's a low pressure in another area, it's, you know, high pressure, things like that. And why this would <clears throat> become such an interesting tool to play with in the classroom and learn a little bit about sound and frequency. Talking about vibrations, what we also can show is when this is inside my mouth, of course, I can't see what's happening to these reeds. So musical instruments have these things called reeds. Woodwind instruments have them. Uh, the flute doesn't, but instruments like the clarinet, oboe, and so on have something called vibrating reeds, right? So this is exactly uh, simulating that. If I put this in my mouth in the opposite direction, 
and take air in. So now I'm sucking air in and it's coming again through those reeds. I can actually see them vibrate clearly. Yeah, and that's happening hundreds of times per second to produce that particular pitch or frequency of sound. And we can see how it's the vibrations that are causing the sound. Because if I blow from the other end, which, which doesn't have the cut, I'm blowing as hard, but it doesn't because this, this area is firm and not cut. These don't vibrate easily, so they don't go up and down. And so you don't get any sound, yeah. So here this thing is opening and closing, opening and closing constantly, and that's what's creating the sound. So that's another, it's a, it's a, you know, great uh, implement to study various features of sound and introduce it in the classroom and have a lot of fun making your own flute with different holes, see if you get different notes and so on. We call this the oboe because it's an instrument with two reeds, so we call it a straw oboe. Because technically the oboe is a Western instrument that has two vibrating reeds, which produces a very distinct note, which is, why, which is also why the oboe is used in all orchestras, which if you don't have a piano or a keyboard instrument, it's the oboe that's used as the, uh, the A is played on the oboe and all instruments tune according to that, because the note is very distinct. And that happens when you have these two distinct vibrating reeds, it produces a very clear sound like a Shruti Peti or a tuning fork uh, would do. Yeah. So that is a little bit about a sound instrument. We can go further and make some more very exciting activities. Some of you may have seen this. This is just a normal double A cell. To that, I've attached a rubber tube so that it can hold two safety pins on the end of the cell. And I've placed two or three ring magnets in the middle of the cell. And I'm attaching a copper coil, which I've wound. So this is an insulated copper coil, but it has these two arms or two leads which have scraped off the insulation. And I place this inside the, uh, inside the safety pin. So that's the idea of using a safety pin. You can already see that this fellow is moving a little bit and wanting to rotate. So it's required slight, of course, adjustments of how you place the magnet and how you place the coil. And after a certain point, the coil is able to spin just with the uh, just with the electrical power that's coming from the battery, and it's interacting with a permanent magnet. So here we are making a we are making an electromagnet and have it interact with permanent magnet to demonstrate how you can easily make a simple DC motor just with such simple materials. Again, slightly specialized material because you need the magnet, you need this enameled copper coil, but it's a very simple demonstration of a DC motor, right? And, and as long as a battery has power, that thing will uh, rotate. Uh, if you can make a motor, you can also do the opposite and that would be making a generator. So in this case, I'm using electrical power to me mechanically rotate something. What can I use mechanical power to generate electricity? So I have a small, demonstration of that here as well. So in this case, I need a more powerful magnet. So that's a neodymium magnet. It's placed inside a syringe that is empty. And the end of the, uh, on the syringe, I have wound thin copper wire. Now here I have many turns of copper wire. That's why we use a thin wire. So about seven or 800 turns of copper wire around the syringe. And the two ends of that copper wire are connected to an LED that I've mounted here on an ice cream stick. So that when I move the magnets Hello. within this copper Hello. coil. Yes. Hi, Malakshmi ma'am. This is uh, Malaika ma'am here. Uh, yes, I just asked a question regarding the... Yeah. Uh, actually, I just wanted to know uh, where do you see... Oh, okay, okay, ma'am. I have not scrolled to the right. Okay, okay. So you just have to go there and view result, is it? Okay. Sorry, uh, so ma'am, you have not unmuted. Yeah, please unmute. Don't. Oh, uh, got it, got it, got it. All right. I had hello. not moved my cursor to the right. I was only this. seeing until few view full result. So, okay. Just so one minute. I'll, I'll mute yeah. all. And... Yeah, please mute everybody. I'll unmute myself and continue. So here we have a magnet within this cylinder just moves within this copper coil and we are getting a beautiful LED to light up. Okay, So we 
have a simple model of a generator as well uh, using again <clears throat> slightly specialized materials but ones that can uh, you can easily play with and use for a long time yeah so uh, back to you uh, vishal i mean of course we can go to talk concepts on talk electromagnetic in a lot of interesting stories but a lot of you may be knowing that in any case but just to tell you about the kind of things that you could introduce uh, in a classroom setting uh, and making activities like this okay uh, we'll we'll now come to a, a big picture of the program etc i'll make uh, the last two demonstrations uh, there's one very interesting one which uh, we have come across where we use a glass bead so what you see on the ice cream stick uh, stick behind the uh, black tape is a small 2.5 mm diameter glass bead there's another one which is 4.5 mm diameter uh, so two glass beads uh, these can act as a microscope uh, only thing is as a lens keeps becoming smaller and smaller the magnification increases but the focal length keeps decreasing so for me to use this as a microscope i i need to place it on the object which i want to view in this case i have a so i place it literally on the object keep it this close to my eyes and point it to a light source but because it is this handy and portable i can as well uh, fix it behind the mobile camera and uh, let me see if i can give you all a view of uh, okay so what i have placed here uh, behind is the behind the camera is the ice cream stick microscope and behind that is a slide uh, let me see if i can give you a better view as i said the focal length is very very short and hence i need to adjust it a little uh manually and that uh, there is a very specific point where i get this focus i hope you are able to uh, see what's inside the slide if you can then please type on the chat window what do you think this is so that would give us a confirmation if the uh view of the uh, view through the microscope is visible to you people have already started writing in vishal onion cells was the first one and then everyone else plant cell after that plant cell onion cell i think people have got yeah. it yeah <laughs> that's right uh okay let me get the okay back okay uh something as simple as this can be used as a microscope of course the special material here is the glass bead and uh even we source it from outside india we don't easily get it typically the dentists use it uh, because the melting point of glass is much higher close to 300 degrees celsius so they have lot of glass beads in a container and they put their tools inside and at that temperature uh, all the bacteria they die uh, only thing is those glass beads are not clear beads and uh, hence so far we have not found a source in india uh, <clears throat> but we can package kits like these and provide it to children so there is one more which i'll show which is uh, coming out from a kit for which i require uh, i have a copper strip here i have a filter paper and a magnesium strip and what i'll do is place the magnesium strip on the along the diameter of this filter paper so i've cut the filter paper into half and i'll wrap the filter paper around the magnesium strip i fold the extra filter paper i'm making it right here just to show the simplicity of the design now i'll place this on the copper strip and close it from the two sides and as i do that what i have just made is a single per magnesium cell electric cell is ready to light a red led using a copper magnesium cell i require two of them 
So I'll connect them in series. I have one which was ready with me. So I'll connect this in series for which I just need to connect the magnesium part to copper. And now I have a two cell battery, a two cell magnesium copper battery ready with me. This end, the longer leg, I'll connect it to the copper strip and the battery is ready. As you can see, it's not glowing right now because what's separating the two metals is just air. I'll again uh, take the vinegar which I had in this bottle and wet both the cells. And let's see if we can make this battery work. So I've placed a few drops of vinegar here. And as you can see, probably because the other cell was already partially wet. I hope in spite of the reflection from the tube light, you are able to see the LED glow. Very clearly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I think I would now spend some time uh, sharing more details about our program and uh, I see a request from many of you how you can get access to these resources. So we'll probably spend the next half an hour uh, sharing those details. I see that Prachita has already been responding to uh, some of the questions. Uh, let me take help of a presentation and uh, show this. Uh, Pro, any, any, anything that you wanted to add? No, just the fact that since we want the teachers also to make, we can uh, we can go uh, talk about the classroom and the wave turbine model. Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, so we, we are compiling all these resources. Uh, so why, why don't you quickly demo wave turbine and then yeah. you can share the link. I'll, I'll okay. share the link. Yeah, on the chat share the link. So the idea of this whole workshop is that the teachers also should go back with something. Uh, so that you can also experience this entire process of making something simple with household materials and then uh, experiencing what a child would go through when they do this program, which is the making part, filling out what we call an observation table uh, by doing some experiments and some variations on that, uh, on the model that you make. And then, <clears throat> uh, you know, submitting that in a Google Classroom and basically going through that process of uh, that a child does when they go through each of these activities. And it will give you an idea of how this can also be therefore implemented with children, uh, you know, in your school or in your classroom or whatever setting and uh, for you to go through this entire process. So for that, we are going to share a link with you, which will allow you to join a Google classroom. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can almost immediately log in uh, and you'll have access to these uh, several resources, which is the, uh, instruction guide, instruction video, uh, materials to be used, and then an observation sheet that you fill in after playing with and making this particular model. So the one that we have inducted or want to induct all of you in is a simple one where you make something again from purely household materials. So you basically one would need a plastic bottle. Again, it's been chopped uh, at the bottom. Here we are using the part of the bottle. Remember for the sprinkler I showed you, part of the bottle that's chopped at the bottom. Here we are using the other part of the bottle, the top part. Uh, on the cap, I have attached two safety pins with tape. Okay. I've made a hole at one end of the cap. I put a straw there just to uh, make you aware of the location of the hole, but that's not necessary when you actually make this activity. It's done without this small piece of straw here. It can just be a hole in the cap. And on top, on a toothpick or any kind of straight piece of water or uh, an axle of any sort. I have made a small turbine using uh, using cardboard. And this cardboard is basically waste uh, conflicts box or soap box or any of those things. Uh, you can use it to make these wonderful multi-blade turbines. You can change the number of blades. You can change the length of the turbine. You can use bigger safety pins, smaller safety pins. Do a whole host of variations, location of the hole on the cap, so on and so forth. And you have this wonderful implement, which you can just bob up and down in a container of water and get to see the turbine actually rotate. Yeah. So 
very very uh, fun experiment to make easy to make uh, all the lots of teacher workshops we've done over the summer the thousands of teachers actually they've all made this activity and then come and attended our workshop and uh, we've talked about uh, you know various aspects of this activity here you we want all you teachers to also have the same experience and therefore we are inviting you into the google classroom where the link has just been shared by vishal if you click on that you will be able to access these resources and make these and then submit your uh, assignments which is a working model of this uh, which is a video of your working model and uh, the filled in observation sheet, which can be digitally filled in. It's a, um, a digitally fillable PDF that can be done on any uh, PDF reader. You don't need to install any special software for that. And you'll be able to fill in that observation sheet as well. So this, we call it a wave turbine model because in, in actuality, it's the waves that go up and down, like this mark going up and down, and we'll be able to rotate a turbine. Uh, this was actually invented by a girl in Maharashtra about 20 years back. She was only eight or 10 years old. She used to work with, uh, she used to go to school in the morning and in the afternoon help her mother with chores that her mom used to do working in different houses and so on. This was in a village uh, in Maharashtra. And she made this using junk material that she found on the riverbank and uh, happened to exhibit it at a school exhibition. It got recognized by the Maharashtra government and she got a scholarship to study for the rest of her uh, young student life through college and today she's a professional engineer uh, just by making something as simple as this her name is Durga so we often also call this the Durga Jetty so it's also a nice story to attach to this activity and what's very interesting about having a turbine like that is what's the use of a turbine if it can't uh, you know do something fun for us as well so here I've just to show you to show you a simulation of that this is a turbine here uh, attached in the same way. So if I had a cap here and a wind uh, blowing this turbine, I can spin this turbine and make the LED glow again. Again, like the generator I showed you earlier where the magnet went up and down. Here the magnet rotates. The coil is of course around this container. And if I blow on this turbine, you can also extension of the wave turbine mount it with something like this and you have a wave turbine generator as well. So this is just to give you an example. This is not something that's there in the classroom for you to make, but just to show you an example of how you can extend something as simple as that to again, uh, generate something, you know, electricity in this case. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Drew. I can see that uh, many of you have already started joining the classroom. Uh, and there are questions uh, about uh, do you have uh, subject specific uh, sites? So let me take you through the presentation, which should hopefully answer the questions. I just shared my screen. Uh, as Prachita said in the beginning, we are calling this program as Unlab because we want to break the notion that interesting work can happen only in laboratory. Uh, quick extension of what we already talked in the beginning goes to 350 activities. These two links to our YouTube channel and our instruction guide website, Prachita has already shared on the chat window. To give the, uh, like throw some numbers to give an idea about the basis on which this pedagogy has evolved uh, is based on a variety of experience that uh, we had, uh, we have worked with uh, many states and a variety of school uh, children and teachers. Uh, this photograph that you see in the slide, that is Sir C.V. Raman's home and our office is based out of uh, his home, a uh, beautiful two acre campus. We have been working with the RRI Trust for the last four years and uh, we have been jointly hosting the Salmon Awards competition, which is a free competition for any child across India. Uh, now I would like to take some time and give, a, uh, give an introduction to the methodology. Uh, for that I'm using uh, one example. It's a very simple question which I want to ask the way we did before this. Uh, I, I will launch a poll question to take your opinion. So the question is this. 
you are standing in front of a mirror size of the mirror is such that you see your full body but you would like to see more of your body so what exactly should you do should you go far should you come closer uh, or will it not make any difference or it depends on the size of the mirror and to uh, let me ask this question to you just to take a quick poll last 10 seconds okay i can see that 85% people said move away from the mirror 2% have said move closer to the mirror zero have said it makes no difference and 13% have said it depends on the size of the mirror okay uh, i'm i'm going to share uh, my response my understanding i would request you to not believe me and please go back and try it out the same question was asked uh, by this foundation called annenberg foundation and they conducted a survey it was asked to a barber who had been running that shop for 20 years and moving around with mirrors day and night the truth is it makes no difference you move away you move closer you will continue to see the same uh, boundaries if you are not able to see let's say the your hair if you are not able to see anything below stomach you will not be able to see even if you move away and the reason i picked this example is when i was thrown this question i had the same response as the 85% of you and i was surprisingly shocked a mirror is something that all of us experience at least once in a day and as i said even a person who is experiencing it day and night for 20 years hasn't got it right and there is a very specific point so while i will try to quickly explain the reason behind it the science behind it uh, there is a very specific point which i am trying to make so let me take you through the reason so you are standing here now when do we see something when an incident ray from that point comes out from that point let's say in this case the incident ray is coming from the shoulder it falls on the mirror and then it reaches the eyes and then you can see the shoulder now let's take incident ray from another point in the body that reaches the eyes now let's take one incident ray which is coming from the knee part of the body and it's not visible because there is not uh, the the mirror doesn't exist and this line that you see that's the normal now let's move this person slightly away and as you can see though you have moved away the point so what has changed is the angle at which the incident ray is falling if there was a mirror there then you would have seen so the angle of the incident ray and reflected ray has changed but what has not changed is the position of normal because the position of normal line depends only on three factors the position of your eye the position of the point in, on the body from where you which you want to see and the length of the mirror and actually it's not to be precise it's the length the part of the mirror which is from your eye point till the bottom of the mirror and hence it doesn't make a difference if you keep going further and further because the position of normal does not change and through this the point i am trying to make is when it comes to experience the uh, base learning experience alone is not enough and this is something we ourselves learned as we started taking these experiments to children initially like the gentleman from whom we draw inspiration uh, his name is arvind gupta we also started believing that it's enough to trigger the curiosity and leave it to the child to explore further but uh, we started realizing it's the concrete experience is just the beginning and as we started designing further resources we realized that there are these very specific stages uh, that we go through when we 
really truly learn something through experience so after the experience you need to reflect back on it you need to observe collect data and try to draw inferences from it and then a concept has to fall in place so in the case of the mirror there is a i went with the assumption that certain basics are clear to the teachers but otherwise those would have got covered that how exactly do we see anything that we manage to see uh, so the conceptualization has to happen and after that happens so uh, <clears throat> out of you uh, some of you will go back with this learning that yeah uh, when you move away from the mirror it doesn't make a difference some of you will not believe as as i requested you to and you would start playing around you'll try to see if i change the shape of the mirror so instead of plane mirror if i had concave mirror or convex mirror does it make a difference if i want to actually see more part of my body do i need to lift the position of my above or do i need to lift it below when you start doing experimentation yourself actively that's when the final the cycle completes and we realize that the gentleman he had already stated this and it fits perfectly uh, called the uh, cobes cycle our entire methodology uh, is based on cobes cycle i'll quickly share what are the resources that we are creating uh, keeping uh, cobes cycle in mind and which we make available to the uh, school teachers and children uh, for the experience part some of the activities what we call as activities meaning tactile activities for these activities uh, each of them we have the instruction guides and videos the two links which prachita shared with you on the chat window one is the link to the instruction guides another to the videos on youtube and all of these by the way are open source uh, <clears throat> other than this we either provide the kits in some cases where it's household material material list is sufficient but let's say you don't want to procure the kits from us given the pandemic situation let's say you want to figure out a way to arrange it locally we would also be happy to uh, publish the list of materials for the cases let's say the battery if you can arrange uh, a copper strip or even a copper wire and some nails it should be possible we would provide the alternate material list as well and of course uh, our team provides the support uh through various forums like whatsapp or google classroom uh which is required for teaching uh we uh, have custom designed observation sheet for each experiment because the standard observation format may or may not be sufficient to draw attention of the child to a specific aspect in case of the battery it would be interesting to ask what would happen if i i put sugar water into this or salt water solution or plain water for that matter the drinking water or distilled water will the led glow in that case now on on his own child may or may not do that observation sheets which are typically designed based on the format of predicting first and then observing then we also have a quick quiz i'll try to give a glimpse of the of one of the quizzes Uh, we are calling it formative because this is the stage when the concepts are still getting formed no discussion has happened yet the abstract conceptualization happens through a live session which could be conducted by our facilitator or we can provide you the lesson plan and the teachers can conduct on their own uh, we would provide the ppt that we are creating and we are using ourselves we would also be happy to share those ppts with you after the live session it makes sense to check whether child has actually got it or not only then we know whether our learning objectives were met and for that we have the summative quiz as uh, multiple places prachita also demonstrated some of the variations we have documented some variations for almost each experiment we, we also share the guides and videos for the variations and in special cases we also provide mentoring support and then of course everything links back to the raman awards where the child can submit his or her innovation uh this is a glimpse of how you would see it on the google classroom some of you have already joined our classroom and hence you will be able to see as you can see uh, instruction guides videos and then there is one assignment 
uh, for both video and observation table. So the field observation table or after completing that activity, the child will record a, photo, a video or take a photo and submit that under the assignment section. Concept connection is where we are sharing the pre-recorded sessions or PPTs and lesson plans. Uh, the entire uh, model is feasible because uh, of the way it gets implemented. So first step for a child is to join the platform, which right now happens to be Google Classroom. We may soon shift to our own custom platform. Work on that activity. While working on that activity, any support required, our team would be providing that either through the business WhatsApp or on the Google Classroom forum. Fill the observation. And as I already said, that's the stage when after filling the observations, the concepts are forming. So it would be good for the child to check whether I'm thinking I'm hypothesizing in the right direction or not. And after that, a live session and a summative quiz. And the point I want to highlight is some of you were asking how would it be possible to conduct uh, lab experiments online. It is feasible because of this one fundamental switch that some part of the lab experiment is happening asynchronously. That is, the child is doing at his or her pace. So we typically, in uh, the existing cohorts that we have, uh, we typically provide one week to a child per experiment. So in that one week, child goes through this entire process till, summit, till formative quiz. Then we have a live session which happens together and there is one session for where, uh, which is scheduled for the child to write the quiz. And the entire program is uh, from 14 to 28 activities, uh, annual program. Uh, I'm giving this range because some people opt for going only with the household materials, uh, whereas some would like to have the kit-based option as well. And after uh, all this is done, we also provide a regular report through this one score that we track for each child across the activities, which we are calling as the TAC quotient. The TAC quotient derives uh, the data from six different sources, which the slide is showing. And through this, we arrive at a weighted average score called the TAC quotient. For IGCSE, uh, as I understand, uh, we have stage one till stage nine in the Cambridge board and then the IGCSE syllabus. And in most of the schools, the IGCSE syllabus is implemented across the two years, ninth and 10th. So what we have done is we have identified 56 taxis for the entire IGCSE curriculum. 28 are based on household material, 28 based on kits or special material. Uh, and further, these 28, uh, have been split into 14, 14 based on some assumptions we made, but as the slide already says, uh, this may vary from school to school and we will be happy to customize this if you want to change the split between the grade nine and grade 10. Okay, uh, if there are any questions, I can take that. But before that, let me give you a glimpse of the Google Classroom. Sorry. So for battery, uh, this is how it would look. This is how the instruction guide would be. Uh, so the instruction guide uh, is mainly because some children prefer to have uh, a step-by-step -step instruction along with photographs. Uh, they prefer reading text-based instructions instead of watching a video. Uh, so we have the instruction guide. We also have uh, three to five minute videos. Uh, okay, 
This is one issue with Zoom. I can't switch without stopping sharing. This is what typical quiz looks like. So we have uh, chosen a platform which allows us to create uh, some very interesting quizzes. For example, in this case, it's one of the questions from the formative quiz where the child has to enter in this text whether I would connect the shorter leg of the LED to copper or longer leg. And that, that's the text which the child will enter here. Uh, in the same way, there are these uh, summative quizzes where uh, we would be testing the concept. Let's say in this case, it's saying dash is a substance that donates dash ion. So let's say the right answer is that, yeah, add donates H plus ion. So child would, child would do this and submit. This is the uh, syllabus map. Uh, it is for the ninth grade. The last column, uh, I hope uh, you are able to see it, that tells you whether wherever we are saying open then that experiment can be done using household materials and in some cases special material is required. So we would be happy to share the syllabus map and uh, splitting between 9th and 10th that can also be customized. Okay, uh, we can take questions. I can see that uh, yes, some already like after joining classroom the, some of the yeah. after joining Google classroom how can we access the material is one of the questions so when uh, it's accessing the resources the instruction guides and all that they're all listed in the Google classroom if you mean the physical materials, then for those activities, if a school happens to choose those, then those materials will be sent to the school or the child, depending on how we do it. For AS and A-level, uh, I, I see that even the CBSC schools have been asking for the 11th, 12th mapping. What we have noticed is it gets harder and harder to do uh, the experiments at the AS and A level or for that matter 11th, 12th grade uh, without uh, sufficient measuring instruments. So we would take a little longer before we can have a good solution there. Since a lot of our uh, philosophy is based on experiments being able to be done with simple materials without a high cost uh, overall, uh, we have so far refrained from getting high end instruments or uh, expensive chemicals, materials, uh, etc. into our activities. Uh, so, that, so that's why we've focused so far till 10th standard and I guess with future demand we will uh, also look at 11th and 12th grade to see what can be done with some of those instruments and measuring devices and uh, even more specialized uh, stuff, manufactured stuff that might be required for, uh, for those grades. So do we I have anything with the biological materials or is it only confined with the physics only? Physics, chem and bio, all, all three. Right? All the three, okay, fine. Oh, great, Diane. Uh, uh, wonderful, uh, Vishal and uh, Prochita. So that was uh, wonderful information that has been shared with uh, the teachers. And uh, so I think the, the, the next lot of questions would be in terms of uh, working uh, more details in terms of how do we subscribe or how do we get access to these materials and, and those sorts. So uh, what I would request is uh, you can send me some more information about uh, the methods like you were talking about. You could also customize few things and also they are uh, available as a ready platter and things like that. So if you can send all those details to me uh, or Raghu or anybody who can send all those details to me, I will pass it on to the group.
and also the group, uh, the people who are interested or the schools who are interested will directly get in touch with you. So that, that would be a great way of working. And uh, I'm sure that I need to connect with both of you separately later so that uh, we, can, we can talk about uh, more other things that uh, what could be done. In fact, we don't have much practicals for A levels. We only have for AS levels. So uh, we don't have any practicals for A levels as such. So uh, we okay. will see that how we can work that out and also probably I, I want to take your advice on that as well in terms of what we can do there in that space. But for IGCAC and also the down, I mean, the, the other uh, uh, grades, I think these are these are very, very useful experiments. And also I would request that we should also host another uh, kind of uh, uh, introductory session for the primary and also uh, uh, we call them as a low secondary se uh, uh, section that is from grade one to grade eight. So we can talk exclusively on that to those uh, schools and also those teachers where we can start with, uh, uh, I mean, your initial concepts of science and also other uh, other other concepts. So so with that said, so uh, I would want to. Oh, there are some questions that if you want to attempt answering quickly or. Yeah. So one uh, one, one. Uh, caveat. So the uh, Gmail ID has to be used. So even if you are using a school account which is a G Suite uh, ID, it doesn't work sometimes because there are some changes required to the settings. Quite uh, by the default setting of uh, G Suite, they don't allow someone to join from one domain to another domain. So try using your personal Gmail ID for now. Then we will see uh, if we work closely with your school, we'll, we'll figure out a way to yeah, change the setting. Great then. Thank you so much, uh, Vishal and uh, Kuchita and also Raghu, Padma Prasad, all of you, I think uh, it, it was a well-coordinated uh, uh, effort. And thanks uh, teachers and also the school principals who have joined and uh, our, our webinars will continue and uh, the attempt is every Thursday or every Monday we should have one webinar to kind of understand uh, what, what better uh, we can bring into the school or bring it to yourselves to implement uh, the programs uh, in, a, in a more meaningful way. So, so we will keep in touch uh, think tag team so probably I think very soon I'll write to you people and also understand more about it. And uh, thanks all of you and we'll keep it, keep going with this kind of series of webinars. Thank you and have a great day ahead and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.